Hey, Tina, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, well, welcome everyone. My name is Tina McAndrew. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the director at the Stowe Library, uh, Randall uh, Library in Stowe, and Sally has graciously reached out to me many times, and I'm very, very grateful to her um, so that we can collaborate on joint programs, and it's great to see Stowe faces and Maynard faces and people actually from all over tonight, as I'm seeing in the chat. So um, again, thank you to Sally, and thank you for um, organizing this with Jane. So um, I do want to just say that we are doing another joint program next week with Maynard, and it's a talk by author Ted Reinstein, I believe is how you say it. Um, it's a timely topic, even though we're venturing into March. Um, he wrote a book about um, the unsung heroes in baseball who helped to break down the color barrier in the sport. So I'm really looking forward to that one as well. Um, so again, uh, welcome, and I'll hand it over to Sally. Okay, thanks, Tina. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, the Friends of the Maynard Library uh, for their support of this program, as well as the Randall Library Friends Association. Um, um, it, it's been a <laughs> it's been a great collaboration, um, and we're we're so happy to welcome people from so from both towns and from all over Massachusetts and the whole country. Um, just a, a technical note, um, we, we are recording this talk um, and um, Jane will, will be happy to answer questions. Um, feel free to type them in the chat as we go along, but she'll answer them during the Q&A session. Um, and we've also enabled transcription, so if that's useful for you, you can use that function if you'd like. Uh, let's see, um, and I will put a link to the um, Ted Reinstein talk in the chat. So if you haven't registered for that, we hope you hope to see you next week. It's um, March Tuesday, March 8th. Um, and now I would like to um, introduce Dane O'Neill. We are thrilled to have Jane back. She's done a number of talks for the Maynard Library and it's, it's nice tonight to, sh to share with Stowe as well. Um, you can see previous talks on the Maynard Library YouTube channel. Um, but also if you'd like more in-person talks um, or Zoom talks, um, please let us know, right? You can write to me or write to Tina, or you can just reply to the, um, the email with your Zoom link in it. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, Jane O'Neill of Culturally, Culturally Curious is with us tonight. Um, she holds a master's degree in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She's worked at some of New Hampshire's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. She's taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And in honor of Black History Month, um, Jane will be speaking tonight about the fascinating life and work of Faith Ringgold. Welcome, Jane. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you so much, Sally and Tina, for inviting me back. Um, and thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your night tonight to learn a little bit more about Faith Ringgold. If there are any audio or technical issues tonight, uh, I would just ask that, um, that Tina or Sally kind of jump back in, because um, once I get going, I'm on a roll, <laughs> and I won't necessarily be stopping to look at the chats until, um, until the end of the program. So we'll be spending about the next hour together tonight, and this is jam-packed, full of, of really good information about this incredible artist. But before we leave the, our title slide here, I just wanted to touch on this image just for a moment because it's a good introduction to Faith Ringgold and her work. We are, of course, looking at one of her famous quilts that's also a, a painted quilt. And in this case, it celebrates one of her childhood friends who grew up to be a preeminent jazz saxophonist. His name was Sonny Rollins. And this is from 1986. So, um, so it's joyful. The colors are gorgeous. It's exuberant. And it gives us a good taste of what is to come. So let me start off by 
giving us a taste of the artist. This is Faith Ringgold. She is 91 years young. She's actually the first artist I've presented on who's still alive. So I have to pause here for a moment just to say she owns all of the works that we're going to be looking at tonight. And if she isn't already your favorite artist, I think by the end of the hour, she might be. So we're going to start off by getting a brief introduction to her life. Uh, focusing on the, the part of her life sort, that sort of led to her becoming an artist. And then we'll zoom in on, um, on her paintings and, and how they touched on political issues such as racism and sexism. Then we're going to be skipping over about a decade or so of her work and focusing on her quilts, which I think are real crowd pleasers. They tend to be her most well-known work. So I wanted to share with you some of her best. And then we will finish up tonight by looking at some things that she's done recently and what I'm referring to as her renaissance, because um, perhaps you'll get the sense that maybe the world wasn't really ready for her when she first launched as an artist, but these days people can't get enough of her, myself included. <laughs> so let's get started with an introduction to Faith Ringgold, perhaps one of the most adorable babies of all time. She was born in 1930 and she grew up in Harlem, New York. Here she is with her two older siblings and they're, um, they're all dressed impeccably because in fact, her mother was a fashion designer. The, this is a photo of her mother and her father, and this is her mother's business card over here. So throughout Faith Ringgold's life, her mother was working in fabric, designing clothes, staging fashion shows. This was really her life. And, um, and Faith Ringgold played an integral part to that. But you can imagine, too, she grew up sort of, you know, with fabric scraps in her hand and, um, and was kind of, she had first, uh, 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 you know, uh, front row access to that kind of creative work. Now, going back another generation, this is actually Faith Ringgold's uh, grandmother. And if you have really good eyes, you might even be able to make out the, the sign behind her, which says dressmaking. So for generations, uh, this is a family, a, a, a matriarchal line too, that has been engaged in creative work with fabric. So it almost seems like it's Faith Ringgold's destiny in some ways. Now, I mentioned she grew up during the Great Depression in Harlem. This is a photo of her and her mother walking down the street when she was a child and she talked about never feeling like she was poor or oppressed as a child she uh she was living in a neighborhood that i think that was still sort of buzzing and vibrant from the gains, the advances that came about during the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s, where you have all of these black intellectuals and, um, and singers and dancers and artists coming together in this community and creating work uh, that essentially reflected the black community that uh, was unprecedented in American history. So this was, this was the foundation that she grew up on. She literally grew up around the corner from Ella Fitzgerald and from Duke Ellington. So to be surrounded by, by this level of, of skill and mastery in, in so many different creative realms, Faith Ringgold sort of framed it as, you know, it, it set the stage for a, a kind of unlimited possibilities in the creative realm for her. So what a great way to get started. Now, she is also a very well-educated individual. This is her high school graduation photo from 1948. A few years later, she went and graduated from college, the City College of New York. She had originally enrolled to become an art major big surprise. But when she got there, she found out that that um, that women were not allowed to major in art. So instead, she had to shift gears and become an art education major. And after she graduated, she became a, an art teacher in New York City public schools. So along the way, she kept uh, she kept up with her studies and, and got a graduate degree as well. So we can see her over here with her family after uh, earning her graduate degree. So while she's working full time and and while she's going to school, she has uh, has children. So, I mean, think of her juggling all of these things. She did get married in 1950 to a jazz, uh, a, a jazz pianist. His name was Robert Earl Wallace. And they were only married for about five years. The, the relationship didn't last. And, and in fact, Robert Earl Wallace became uh, addicted to heroin and, and sort of died prematurely. So, um, so Faith Ringgold was on, on her own for, for some time with her daughter. And because it was a kind of a strong 
strong matriarchal family, I think she got a lot of support from, from her mother. But, but you can see she's kind of living her best life in the, in the late 1950s. Uh, here she is with her daughters all dressed up to go to a dance class or recital. And here she is with her mother and her daughters in 1961, heading off to Europe on the SS Liberté. And that was a little bit of a, um, a spy mission, a recognizance, recognizance mission for Faith Ringgold because she was going to Europe to, to study artists, European masters, and to kind of get a sense as to whether or not she herself could become an artist too. So that was an important trip for her. But just a few more images to just show that she was um, uh, living a really comfortable existence at the end of the 1950s. This is her in her apartment over on the left. And this is her modeling address at one of her mother's fashion shows on the right. And she actually credits those fashion shows as, um, as the, the, the place where she kind of found her speaking voice. I know there's a lot of people out there that don't feel comfortable talking in front of a crowd. Faith Ringgold was included in that. And one day her mother just kind of handed her the microphone and expected her to MC. And uh, uh, she sort of began to fumble with it and her mom gave her a quick little instruction and then kind of sashayed away. And and she was thrown into the deep end, but she found her footing and she became really comfortable in front of a crowd. You're going to see that Faith Ringgold is somebody who has a voice and uses it. Shortly thereafter, she um, gets married to a, a friend of hers who had been uh, close to her for, for, um, for some years. This was 1962. Her husband was named or is named Burdette Ringgold. He was nicknamed Birdie. So here they are on their wedding day. Here she is with her daughters that same day. And Birdie really provided for the family, uh, so much so that Faith Ringgold was able to become a full-time artist. She took over their dining room that became her art studio and um and she she got to work and and birdie played a, a pretty large supportive role in her life and in her career and occasionally he shows up in her artwork this is a, a work from the late 1990s where you can see them flying over their house you know with their arms wrapped around each other and this is a photograph of birdie from about a decade or so ago alongside a painted quilt made by his wife a portrait of him. Uh, sadly, he just died two years ago. And so they were close to about 58 years of marriage together. So it was a long and seemingly really happy, um, happy marriage. And, and one of the, the key roles that he played in supporting her in her artwork was that he was oftentimes lugging her framed canvases around New York City because she was insistent on taking her work into galleries so that, um, so that gallery owners could see it in person and really assess it that way. Now we'll finish up our introduction to the artist with these two images and they are both self-portraits. The one on the left was painted in 1959 and the one on the right was painted in 19. 65. So we can see here that there's been a dramatic shift in the way that she's painting, first of all, and perhaps even in the way that she thinks of herself. So you could sort of think of this one on the left as, as Faith Ringgold, the, the student really, who was still emulating the European masters and trying to paint in their style. And right around this time, she'd gone and taken her work to a gallery owner in New York City, whose name was Ironic. Ruth White. <laughs> and, um, and Ms. White looked at Faith Ringgold and looked at her work, which was all emulating the European masters. And she said, you can't paint like this. Now you could probably take that in a number of different ways, but Faith Ringel decided to take it as like a pass for freedom, that she should be painting what she wanted and how she wanted. So we can see in a short amount of time, she finds her visual voice, she finds her aesthetic, and she begins to paint um, really sort of the paradox of integration in the United States. And, and you know, included in that certainly are a number of depictions of, of African-Americans. And I particularly love 
this self-portrait and um, and the way that she's it, it integrated all of this blue shadow through throughout the portrait. It's uh, it's so striking and it's so strong. So this is a good place to transition and and start thinking about her as a painter and as somebody who with uh, really strong uh, po political beliefs that that manifest themselves in her work, um, advocating for um, equality, equity, and social justice throughout. So some of her earliest paintings, well, this is one of the earliest paintings I could get my hands on in the 1960s. And this one is called They Speak No Evil from 1962. So what's our first impression here? Well, we see these six male figures, they're white, right? They have these tiny little bodies and they're crammed in there together. Their bodies seem really ineffectual other than creating this barrier, right? We can't get beyond them, but they have these big heads and these wide, almost sort of hollowed out, sullen eyes. They're not especially welcoming, are they? <laughs> so, uh, so she's doing something here that I find so incredible because in the history of art, there's oftentimes this assumption that the viewer of a work of art is a man, presumably a white man. So, so much of the history of art has been, you know, beautiful female nudes for the implied um, uh, 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 male gaze. But what Faith Ringgold does with her work, and we see it really early on with a picture like this, is that like a good novelist, she invites us her viewers to take on a new perspective, to imagine seeing the world through somebody else's eyes. And with a work like this, she's asking us, each one of us, to see the world through her eyes, uh, to put on the guise of a Black woman and, and see what it's like to engage with people in positions of power. Well, we don't necessarily get the, the sense here that it is um, a, a positive interaction in any way that we we get the sense of, of the barriers that exist. Now, Faith Ringgold does one better than this because she is looking back at early modern painting. She's looking back at Pablo Picasso and his seminal work from 1907 called Demoiselle d'Avignon. Now, Pablo Picasso revolutionized art in the 20th century with this picture in so many ways because he... Um, he integrated visual aesthetics from African masks and he transformed two of these five nude women, <coughs> excuse me, into these kind of terrifying figures with these abstracted mask-like faces. Faith Ringgold flips the this, this, this script here and, um, and she puts the terrifying mask-like faces on fully dressed men here. And so our relationship with these figures completely changes. Now, in the following year, Faith Ringgold launches her American People's uh, series, which has 20 works in it. I wish I could show you all of them because they're all amazing, but I'm going to show you a lot of them because they're great. So it's 1963. There's so much that's happening in America. You have the assassination of, of JFK. You have the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. You have JFK giving his I Have a Dream speech it, on the mall and the US Capitol. And in the midst of all of this turmoil, you have Faith Ringgold finding her voice as an artist. And the American People series was an opportunity to talk about the existence, the and and the um the communications or lack thereof between white and black people. So this is a work that's simply called Neighbors. It's from 1963. Now imagine your neighbors looking at you like this. Once again, she's forcing us to do that perspective taking. There's scowling, there's these hollow eyes, there's these, there's this expression of like, I wish I was looking at anybody other than you. And we get the sense of just how inhospitable it would be to simply go home, to exist in your own space if your neighbors are looking at you like this. 
This is um, a really striking, really profound work. This next painting done the same year is called For Members Only. And once again, we see a wall of men. Their faces are a little bit more individualized now, but they still have kind of a mask-like quality to it. There's more color in, in this particular painting, uh, um, but we still see these grim, somber expressions. Some of these figures seem to be looking directly at you. Some of them seem to have these unfocused gazes where they're looking just beyond you. And of course, the title here for members only it reminds me of what you might hear at a country club, right? There's some spaces in America that are made for white people or made for members and other places where, uh, and those are places that keep people out. Of course, it reminds us of the fact that there's legalized segregation in the country at this point. So for members only is so much like for whites only. Now in the space of one year, look at how far her painting has come. We've gone from these almost cartoon-like masks to these really sort of sophisticated individualized faces and the use of color here just blows me away. It's really gorgeous. All right, so moving along in this American People series here, this is a really different work. It's not a, a wall of, of little bodies. This is one man and he takes over the whole picture. The, the picture frame can't be contained by him. His body and his face uh, are, are cut off by the edge of the picture. This is called Mr. Charlie from 1964. You'll notice that the color palette here is um, red, white, and blue. There's something very American about Mr. Charlie. He is an older white man. And again, he's got that sort of unfocused gaze. This is Faith Ringgold, once again, asking us, the viewer, to take on the perspective of, of her, of, of her world. What would it be like to engage with a, an older white man who had who's sort of looking past you, sort of looking through you? What does that gesture that he has, what does that mean? It's not that he, it's not sincerity. He doesn't have his hand on his heart. It's like he's misplaced his heart here. And it's like, he's just getting through an interaction to move on to something that's more important to him. Incidentally, the name Mr. Charlie, um, back in the 1960s, I'm not sure if this is true today, referred to, um, was uh, a name in the black community that referred to racist white men. So Mr. Charlie makes a, another appearance in this series. This is a picture called uh, The In Crowd from 1964. And it, I think it sort of speaks to um, what people are willing to tolerate in order to kind of climb the social ladder in, or the social hierarchy really, in America. So we have an older white man at the top of this social ladder. It almost looks like a cor corporate picture in some ways. But as your eye moves down this crowd, we can see that these gestures become more and more aggressive. You almost get the sense that people are being pushed down. This man has a, a, a white hand over his mouth. He's being silenced. But Mr. Charlie is resting very comfortably at the top here. And you'll notice she's included uh, the red arrows pointing down, focusing that energy downwards. We have, uh, uh, once again, these these uh, disturbing stares, these hollowed out stares from each one of these individuals. So our next picture is called Portrait of an American Youth. And so many elements here we've already seen, we're familiar with. There's a lot of arrows in this picture, red, white, and blue, the, the American flag color palette happening here. But we have this one solitary figure. He's a well-dressed young man. And for Faith Ringgold, he represented sort of all the possibility of, um, of, of, of a young man, a young Black man, if racism and prejudice didn't exist. So if he could be considered in the same way as, as, a, as a young white boy, I mean, he shows all the promise in the world, but there's all these subtle indicators here that, um, that this is a world that's set up for, for him to fail, to ensure his failure. We notice that there's all of these downward pointing arrows in this picture, and then also a white silhouette sort of looming behind him. So there's so many factors at play here that will influence this young man's life. And, um, and, and we see that it's sort of beyond his control. 
Faith Ringgold painted this picture sort of as an homage to her own brother, her older brother, who had been the victim of a racially motivated attack when he was a teenager. He had been beaten so badly that when he came home, Faith Ringgold could see his skull. His mother rushed him to the nearest hospital where they wouldn't even treat him because he was Black. And this was in New York City in the 19. 19- 40s. So ultimately, her brother's life went downhill. He became addicted to drugs, and then he died in the 1960s, actually just a few years before this was painted. So this was a picture that really showed all the promise of, of a young Black man um, had, had, like I said, racism and prejudice Uh, not been factors in his life. Now, this next work I'm showing you is actually the very first image in the series, in the American People series. So this is from 1963, and, and it's called Between Friends. Now, what do you think is going on in this picture? Are these really friends? Are they having an open conversation? Are they understanding each other? What do you make of these these expressions that they have? Faith Ringgold painted this in response to um, an experience that she had. She was staying with a friend on Martha's Vineyard for the summer, and this friend hosted um, uh, integrated uh, uh, parties throughout the summer, and in particular, card games with with Black women and with white women. Faith Ringgold sort of felt like the white women just sort of showed up to represent their husbands and their husbands' business interests. They were just kind of playing nice, but not really there to create true connection or to have true connection with the women of color there. So we see that there's literally this kind of barrier between them. And um, and even though we see this white woman in, um, in profile, we sort of get the sense that there's a coldness there where the woman of color looks like she might be seeking something uh, beyond the superficial. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of the scale, here's the artist um, about a decade or so ago uh, uh, lecturing in front of this picture and another one from the American People series. Now, this gives you a sense in terms of how large her painting were. And just that reminder, she's lugging these pictures around New York City to take them to gallery owners to get them exhibited. And she was striking out again and again and again. People weren't really ready to look at these works. And the next, the, the next three pictures that I have for you are, I think of as like her master works from this series. And you'll see that they are challenging subject matters. Okay. So, um, so this is a work. Uh, I almost think of this as like the culmination of all of those empty stairs we've seen so far. This is called U.S. Postage Commemorating the Advent of Black Power from 1967. Now, spoiler alert, there was no postage stamp commemorating the the advent of Black Power in 1967. And what we're looking at here is not the size of a postage stamp in real life. It's, uh, It's a huge picture that can hold a wall all by itself. So let's zoom back in for a moment just to get a sense in terms of the this very integrated and very nuanced work of art. So Faith Ringgold has painted a hundred faces in this picture. Well, it's like two. It's almost like two pictures uh, 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 hung together here. And many of them are those kind of cold, unfocused, hollowed out stares. It's the white faces that are looking through you, that are disdainful of your existence, that are trying to pretend you don't exist at all. And then there are 10 black faces. Uh, Some of them are also kind of unfocused stares. It's not that they're necessarily much more welcoming, but they are distinct. And you'll notice that they uh, form a diagonal in this composition. So those black faces are balanced out by another diagonal of the black text that reads black power. So it forms this beautiful X across the composition. And that might remind you of the Confederate flag. What an interesting take on the Confederate flag, right? Or it might remind you of Malcolm X. Um, There's all sorts of different ways to to associate this particular composition. But I also want to draw your eye to something that is much more nuanced in this picture. In addition to the words black power, there's also the words white power. Have you seen them yet? They are, they're there and they are sort of the building blocks to this this, um, composition. Um, 
and they're easy to miss. <laughs> right over here, we begin with the W going sideways, and then the H, and then the I, and then the T, and the E. So it's integrated in there. <laughs> it's, um, it's the foundation. Um, everything else rests on top of that white power that's, that's, over, that's in this picture. It's a really smart and very um, moving composition, I think, uh, when, when you start taking it apart. So here is the artist in front of this work recently, and here she is at her first solo exhibition opening in 1967. You can just see the edge of this work over here. So, um, so this was this was certainly pushing a boundary back in 1967, but that doesn't even prepare you for what you're about to see next. This is all still a part of the American People's uh, series, and this is, uh, I think, the biggest work in that series. It's about 12 feet long across, and it's simply called Die. This is a hard one to look at. This is a really challenging work of art. Actually, it is so much so that when I was working at a museum uh, about a decade ago, I remember uh, the curators brought in um, uh, some information about a show from Faith Ringgold that would have sort of centered around this image. And I just thought to myself, oh my goodness, people aren't ready to look at this. I'm not sure anybody will come in to look at this, but in my own defense, I think that the world has changed a lot in the past decade. So what are we looking at here? We are looking at uh, this kind of sea of, of figures. They're all kind of dressed the same, whether they're black or white. The, the men have white button down shirts and, and, um, and black pants on. These women have these short slip dresses, whether they are blonde haired or, or whether or not they're black women. Uh, and we notice some of them have knives, some of them have guns, some of them are battling hand to hand. And this is all laid out on this grid of gray squares. And these gray squares for Faith Ringgold represented the sidewalk. This is a race riot. And in her words, this sort of thing was happening all the time in America in the 1960s, and you wouldn't hear about it on the news. Somebody might go missing, somebody might die, there might be a riot in the streets, and you didn't really hear anything about it. And so she wanted to create a picture that spoke to the violence of the times and, um, and illustrated the way everybody was in this battle for to kind of save their position or to enhance their position in American society. So here, the only people who are safe from it are these two children who are clutching each other, sort of terrified and desperate. And of course, they they um, they don't care that one of them is black and one of them is white. They are they are our, our hope for the future here. Now, this is such a profound and and. Um, and really a visceral, viscerally disturbing picture that the Museum of Modern Art exhibited exhibited it across from Picasso's sort of mid-career seminal work, which is his 1937 mural called Guernica, which he created in response to the horrific bombing of a Spanish town done by the Nazis. And so he shows that, you know, people were trapped in burning buildings. He shows a woman who's lost her baby, a soldier here whose arm has been severed. It's terrifying, but because it's abstracted, because it's monochromatic, in in some ways we can deal with it. We can talk about those horrors. Faith Ringgold's work, I think uh, it's, it's maybe still a little too close to lived experience, to observed reality. And I think that's what makes this uh, still so, um, so moving and provocative today. Here she is talking in front of this work not too long ago. And she said, she wanted to create something uh, to, to make people look, make it so that they couldn't look away. And, um, and she wanted people to look and really see what was going on to, to engage them that way. Unfortunately, like I said, people were not ready to see this. And so she'd paint these works, she'd try to exhibit them, but ultimately she ended up just hanging on to them for 40, 50, 60 years. So the last work in the American People series that, a series that I wanted to share with you is this picture that's from 1967 called The Flag is Bleeding. 
such an interesting work and sort of foreshadows a lot of her later paintings. So we see three figures here, a well-dressed white man, um, a, a, a slender white woman, and a tall black man here. And they're all linked arms together, seemingly as though they're all getting along here, right? But, um, but they are standing sort of behind and amidst the stars and stripes here. And the flag is bleeding. This is, this almost seems like the aftermath of the race riot that we had just witnessed, but they all seem perfectly calm. We notice that the black man has a knife in his hand. And so we, we recognize that the blood here is from, um, is from violence and from, from, from weapons. These people are, are probably hurt. And he in fact is hurt. He's holding a wound on his chest, but we also notice that the pose that he is struck here to, to hold that wound is the same pose for pledging allegiance to the flag. So Faith Ringgold is making a real comment about um, the very nature, the very fabric of American society here. And she she spoke specifically about how she wanted that, that red to be a very visceral experience for, for her viewers. So hopefully it has uh, it sort of shaken a few of us awake tonight. So she engages with the uh, with the format of the flag, with the with the symbolism of the flag throughout her career. This is a very challenging work that she created in 1969 in response to the uh, to the landing on the moon, actually. And so she calls this the flag for the moon. Now, this created a, a real sensation too, because uh, there's some text here to unpack. You'll notice that uh, in the blue field of the white stars, she has embedded the word die. Uh, it's kind of dark lettering here. It's very subtle. But then she's altered the, the red and white stripes of the flag into letters here, very similar to what we saw with the postage stamp before. And it actually spells out um, the N-word, the racial epithet there. So die with the N-word. And so he, this was her commentary really on what the flag represented to her in the late 1960s. And I think when she saw um, you know, the American astronauts uh, place the, the American flag on the moon, it's like this extension of, of the colonization that had happened on our planet. And, um, and she, she needed to create something in response to it. So that brings us to the 1970s, and um, and we see Faith Ringgold sort of starting to dip her toe into activism. This is the woman who was too shy to MC a, a fashion show just a decade before, and now she is stepping up and speaking out. So she and two others um, put together this show called the People's Flag Show, and they invite about a hundred artists to come and create works about using the Ameri the image of the American flag. And so people were doing all sorts of things. They were, you know, dancing nude with flags draped around them, that sort of thing. And it was a, it was a real sensation. Faith Ringgold created this poster to advertise the show. And I know it's a little bit tough to read, uh, but she talks about interpreting the flag and, and, and who does it really belong to. And then I like this part here that says, artists, workers, students, women, third world peoples, are you oppressed? What does this flag mean to you? So here she is with her, um, with her uh, co collaborators for the show. They were all arrested, the three of them, uh, because this was considered desecration of the flag and the American Civil Liberties Union helped to spring them from jail. Incidentally, this fabulous outfit that she was wearing was created by her mother. <laughs> so by the end of the 60s, the beginning of the 1970s, she's really found her voice. She's found her causes too, and she's deeply involved in them. One of her daughters becomes um, a, 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 a sort of a successful art critic, and I believe she has her PhD. She was a professor and really interested in women's studies. So they collaborate on a lot of um, uh, sort of activist organizations. They co-found so many, I, I don't have time to name them, Faith Ringgold speaking at feminist conferences, and she's also showing up to, to protest exhibitions in New York um, 
multiple times. So, so uh, one of the shows that she protested was the Whitney Biennial. One year, I believe they only focused or they only included two female artists in the entire show. And so Faith Ringgold apparently turned to her daughter and said, well, that's just wrong. How many, you know, we have to protest this. How many women should we be asking for? And her daughter, without hesitation, said 50%. If you're going to have an art show, shouldn't it be 50%? So they showed up, they had police whistles, they were um, putting hard boiled eggs throughout the um, throughout the exhibition space. They made themselves heard. Now, at the sa same time, Faith Ringgold is integrating text into her paintings, and she's using this, this uh, composition that was inspired by textile designs from the Congo. It's based on a square that has been divided into triangles. So you kind of have two overlapping squares in this composition here. Freedom, woman, now over here, woman, free your Herself. So she's doing all this to advocate for the equality of, of women and specifically women in the art world. The, um, the, there were also current events that really impacted her. This is a poster she created, her most popular poster in the 1970s called the United States of Attica. And it was created in response, of course, to the Attica prison uprising. Now, if you don't really remember the specifics of, of that uprising, it, what essentially happened were uh, prison prisoners at this prison in upstate New York uh, decided to, um, to rise up to advocate for better, more humane conditions within the prison. And uh, after a standoff, it, it was decided that the state was, would just go in and, um, and kill the, the people who were involved rather than extend negotiations and find a peaceful resolution. So of course, it, it, that was horrifying to so many people. And in the end, I believe it was 43 people in total who died, which included at least one prison guard. So uh, so she creates this, this poster of the United States uh, with all of these documented instances of state violence and the history of violence really throughout the country. And at the end, she says, this map of American violence is incomplete. Please write in whatever you find lacking. So, um, so really, once again, kind of speaking to the character of the country. And once again, she is willing to, you know, put her put her money where her mouth is she showed up to protest um, the role of, of Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York at the time, who made this de decision on how, um, how the prison uprising should be handled. He was also the president of the board of the Museum of Modern Art. So here is Faith Ringgold with her daughter standing out in front talking about impeaching Rockefeller, the, the butcher of Attica. Now, Faith Ringgold at the same time would sometimes lead these impromptu tours of the Museum of Modern Art, which I guess really got the people who work there, including the curators, pretty flustered because she'd walk in and she'd say, oh, well, this will be the future wing of like the Martin Luther King um, uh, section on African-American artists. And this will be the education center telling us about, you know, the history of African-American art. And of course, there were no plans like that in place. It's really only now that, um, that, that museums are starting to have conversations like that. So, um, so one last note in regards to incarcerated people. Faith Ringgold got a grant for $3,000 and decided that she wanted to create a, a work of public art for the women who were incarcerated on Rikers Island. So she went and she interviewed many of the prisoners. And she asked them what they wanted for their lives after they, um, after they were freed from prison. And she used their responses to inform her, her mural and, um, and the depictions of women in the, in the mural. So we see everything, including uh, a police officer, a uh, construction worker, basketball players, and even president, first female president of the United States. We're still not there yet. Um, so in, in the end, she's created this really wonderful mural that was unfortunately over time um, destroyed by, by male prisoners at, at Rikers Island. I shouldn't say destroyed. It was whitewashed by, um, by male prisoners who, after, uh, I guess, moving some prison populations around the space where this, this painting had been installed became a, a, a space for male prisoners and they didn't want to live with it. So here is Faith Ringgold standing in front of this very large painting. And, um, and I think that this is probably a good moment to segue 
um, because we're looking at a large scale work. It's um, it's divided into segments once again using that um, that composition from um, uh, uh, African textiles, but it has women as its subject and its inspiration. And so this is uh, our perfect moment to start thinking about quilts and storytelling. Now, before we get into all of this, I do have to mention we are jumping over a big part of her of her work and her career, basically all of the 1970s, where she was creating these really fascinating sculptures, these soft sculptures that kind of celebrated aspects of African-American life. There was still kind of pointed criticism around it too, but um, but it, it, it's a really, it, it's a divergent uh, body of work. She also created masks and she even did performance art with wearing these masks. But I think because people know and love the quilt so much, we're going to jump over it and, um, and head into quilt making. Now, how did Faith Ringgold go from making paint Paintings to making quilts. Well, one of the one of the kind of seminal moments in her career was she was in Europe. She was at the Rijksmuseum, and she was introduced by one of the guards there to these Tibetan and Nepalese uh, painted scrolls that had fabric uh, frames to them, and. To her, this was a revelation because remember, she's carrying around heavy um, framed canvas paintings throughout New York City to try and show her work. And she thought, what if I could just have these soft uh, 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 paintings that I could roll up and I wouldn't have to ask my, my husband or rely on him for help. So, um, so there was a sense of independence from doing this. And so her first paintings, this is painting on fabric with acrylic paint with a uh, 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 piece uh, uh, quilted frame here. This is called the Slave Rape series. And so uh, obviously it's inspired by the history of African, African women who were kidnapped into slavery. She actually uses her own face and the, fa and the likenesses of her daughters in this series. And the titles here are Fear Will Make You Weak, fight to save your life and run, you might get away. These are from um, the 19, the early 1970s. So we can see she's still making really bold choices as an artist. She's putting stories in front of audiences that many people are still struggle with looking at and talking about today. But we're going to fast forward to the 1980s and that's when she starts making quilts proper. Um, and it's, in so many ways, an organic extension of, of what her family was already doing. This is Faith Ringgold making her first quilt alongside her mother, who taught her so much of what she's supposed to, of what she knew about quilt making. Now, uh, going back generations, going back to women in Faith Ringgold's family who were actual slaves who were making quilts. This was um, this was a tradition within their family, and it's a tradition within so many families. This is a moment where women oftentimes come together they tell stories, they teach each other things, they, um, they raise up young women or in these circles and, and sort of train them for so much of, of what they're supposed to know about life. But of course, quilt making is sort of tied to um, this notion of domestic work. It's considered folk art or it's considered craft. It's considered lesser than paintings in some ways. So Faith Ringgold challenges this while at the same time living within this tradition. And so one of the ways she challenges it is that she paints on fabric. So she's making paintings that are also quilts. And in doing so, she's pushing this boundary of, of, um, of a female domestic craft into sort of the male dominated space of, 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 of contemporary art, contemporary painting. So with this work here, she is, um, it's called uh, Echoes of Harlem. And I just wanted to give you a sense in terms of what it looked like finished. We can see all these great individualized faces here, different skin tones, different poses here. We've come a long way from those vacant stares at the end of the 1960s. Um, but one last note on, on sort of why she transitioned into 
into quilt making. Around the early 1980s, she was, um, she'd written a, an autobiography and she was having trouble getting it published. And she thought, well, I'll tell my own stories through quilts. Now, luckily her mother had been working with her and kind of told her everything she knew because um, sadly her mother passed away after that, that, after helping her with that quilt, The Echoes of Harlem. So this was the first quilt that Faith Ringgold made without her mother. It's from 1983 and it's called Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima? And it is one of her famous story quilts. This is, um, this is almost like a, 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 an invention of, of hers in so many ways. And, and it's very innovative. So she takes this stereotype of Aunt Jemima, the woman from the pancake mix, <laughs> and she creates a whole new story about this woman, an imagined story. Um, Aunt Jemima is, um, is a stereotype that's born out of like minstrelsy in the late 19th century. And she takes Aunt Jemima and makes her into a strong woman, an entrepreneur, um, a family uh, person who, uh, you know, raises up these, these uh, strong kids. In so many ways, she retells the story of Aunt Jemima in the guise of her mother or even herself. So it's as though she's written a book here and flattened it out and, and made it into a canvas. Uh, that central uh, panel here is, uh, it's her handwriting and it's as though it's the title page of a book. You can see the details here, here's Aunt Jemima. She's stitched in the jewelry here and, and she's written out a, um, a really detailed story with a very specific point of view and, um, and dialect that goes along with it. So, um, so she's kind of rewriting history here and, and casting Black women as, as powerful characters. And this is going to be something that we see quite a bit of in her work. The next quilt I wanted to show you is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She created it just a few years later. This is called the Street Story Quilt from 1984. Five, and it's uh, the facade of a building uh, created in three different times. So these three separate quilts hang together like a triptych. And there's a very detailed story that goes along with it. This is another story quilt. So basically all of these white triangles here uh, contain the text for this story. But just to summarize it, it's um, it's the story about this young man who witnesses his mother die in a car accident. You can just see the cars down below. Later on, he sees his father die in, um, in a fire. And then he goes off to Vietnam. His life goes into total turmoil. But then ultimately, he comes home triumphant with a new love here. Here is the artist standing in the galleries at, at the Met just a, a year or so ago uh, with this map massive work of art. And here's a detail over here on the left, we can see uh, from this final panel, just one of those windows, somebody uh, sitting in the window with, um, with like a poster that says, hell no, we won't go. Uncle Sam, don't give a damn. So there's these very integrated stories um, into uh, in in these quilts that that tell what life is like in this community in this building. Incidentally, it took um, the Metropolitan Museum's first curator of African descent to um, to acquire this particular quilt. And when she when she did, it was uh, uh, this is like the late 1980s. The museum was still using card catalogs to um, categorize their pictures and. And, and, and this was miscategorized apparently as simply being a, a quilt and not a, paint, a painted quilt. And so that curator sort of had to argue that, um, that Faith Ringgold's quilt belonged in you know, contemporary art as opposed to, um, to something that was more like craft. So, um, so Faith Ringgold continues to create story quilts. This is her flag story quilt also from 1985. And you can see that the visuals are much less pointed than we saw in the 1960s. Um, uh, in this case, there's all of this uh, dyed fabric here from a textile artist named Marquetta Bell Johnson. They're beautiful. They sort of speak to the multi-ethnic fabric of America, but the story that's embedded here in the white stripes of this flag is it's a very hard pill to swallow. It's the story of a young man who goes off to Vietnam, comes back a paraplegic, and um, and then is accused of raping a white woman. So so still, um, you know these criticisms on on 
American life in so many ways. And, and, and now she's still using the flag as, as a medium to do that. But as we get into the later 1980s, what you'll see with a lot of her quilts and story quilts uh, is a sort of lighter subject matter, things that kind of speak to African-American experience, to African-American women's experiences, and, and things that just kind of celebrate African-American culture and life. So this is the lover's quilt over here on the left. And this is double Dutch on the Golden Gate Bridge from 1988 over on the right. I love this picture. It's just, it, it's such a wonderful fantasy with these kids um, flying in the air playing. So Faith Ringgold uh, is sort of leveling up in her life as well. And so we see her hanging out over here with Maya Angelou and Oprah Winfrey at Maya Angelou's 60th birthday. And on that occasion, Oprah Winfrey commissioned Faith Ringgold to make a portrait, a quilt portrait of Maya Angelou for her next birthday. And so here is the result. Um, <clears throat> this gorgeous work of art that uh, that celebrates, uh, you know, uh, this renowned uh, uh, poet and author and integrates some of her poetry in into the, the text as well. Incidentally, Maya Angelou played a, a, a quilt maker in the movie, How to Make an American Quilt. Here she is in her home uh, with, with her quilt behind her. And when she died in 2014, that quilt was auctioned off and it's now in the collection of the Crystal Bridge, Bridges Museum Museum in Arkansas, which is kind of perfect because um, Maya Angelou is from Arkansas too, but you'll never believe how much it sold for. I, I, it sold for less than half a million dollars, which I think is just unbelievable. It's hard, it's hard to wrap your brain around the fact that something could be um, something so valuable uh, could, could go for so little. So by the end of the 1980s, uh, you have Faith Ringgold taking on subjects that would have a very broad appeal. Who doesn't love a pop culture reference? This is called Who's Bad? <laughs> and it's a celebration of um, Michael Jackson and dancing, really, in response to one of his music videos from 1987. So we have all of these balletic moves in the background and Michael Jackson in the foreground. And so we've come a long way from the race riots of the 1960s, but we still have you know, body, body limbs flying in, um, in every different direction. Now, um, when we get into the 1990s, uh, Faith Ringgold has really hit her stride. This is 1991, and it's perhaps her most famous story quilt. It's called um, Tar Beach, and it was inspired by her own um, childhood because she and her family would go up to the roof of her building, which had tar paper on it, as a, as a place to kind of escape the heat in, in the summer, in the middle of the city. And they pretended it was their beach, and they would lie up there um, and and so she painted a picture on this quilt of children lying on a mattress and the adults kind of eating and socializing over here. And, and you can imagine, you know, the cool air up high on a summer night. And, and this little girl in particular is imagining flying over the George Washington Bridge. So this is also a story quilt and Faith Ringgold turned it into a children's book that has won so many awards. <laughs> and you can go on YouTube and hear her read it too. But it's this wonderful story of Cassie Louise Lightfoot, you know, rising up into the stars and, and flying over the city. It's really wonderful. Um, and, and I think this notion of flying, we'll see, certainly comes back. But we're going to kind of finish up her uh, looking at her quilts with this really impressive um, an ambitious series that she takes on in the early 1990s called the French Collection. It was in so many ways inspired by her mother. It was inspired by that trip that they took to Europe back in the early 1960s when she was thinking, all right, can I be an artist? So for the French Collection series, she invents a protagonist, a young woman named by, by the name of Willia uh, Marie Simone, who goes to, goes to Europe with the same idea in mind this notion of can I be an artist and so we see her kind of exit escapades while she's there and and of course she's interacting with all these major players from the art world but this is a, a really sweet um, introduction to this series that's called Dancing at the Louvre. She went to take her friend with three daughters to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa. And instead, the, the little girls end up dancing in the galleries and they sort of steal the show. And so already we get this notion of, um, of our protagonist as being somebody who can kind of break the rules and have a little fun while she's doing it. This 
next quilt that's a part of the French collection series, it's actually in the collection of the Worcester Museum of Art. I've never seen it on display there yet, uh, though. Uh, it's called Picasso Studio. And we can see our protagonist is serving as a nude model in Picasso's studio. Um, here's Picasso uh, painting her. And the story quilt tells us that while she's sitting there thinking about this and looking around at all these tribal masks and that sort of thing, she begins to think, well, why can't I become an artist? This is sort of her moment of inspiration. So, um, so Faith Ringgold creates this really wonderful image that's called Giverny, where our protagonist is painting in Claude Monet's water lily garden, surrounded by a group of American uh, feminists. And we can see that she's fully dressed. She's painting at the easel, but she's got a male nude model who just so happens to be Picasso. <laughs> and so I'll wrap up uh, a very brief look at the French collection quilts with other art historical references that are also dense with references to African-American life and history. This is called the Quilting Bee at Arles. So it's a reference to uh, Vincent van Gogh and his sunflowers and, um, and the women who are taking part in this Quilting Bee are all women, um, prominent women from the civil rights movement, including Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks. Over here on the right at the Cafe des Artistes, we have um, this incredible collection of black artists from the Harlem Renaissance hanging out in Paris along with Faith Ringgold and, um, and a few uh, post-impressionists like Vincent van Gogh, Paul Gauguin, Toulouse-Lautrec. But we have our protagonist here kind of at the center who is um, fascinating everybody at this moment. So it's, um, it's, you know, it's overlaying art history with black history. It's retelling these stories with, um, with female black protagonists. And, and in so many ways, it's echoing her own life story. These are such, it's such a, a brilliant uh, 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 series. And there's 12 works in this particular French collection series. Um, several of them are, are owned privately today. So we're going to switch gears. We'll wrap up. And I know we've got very little time, we're over time. So I'll do this very quickly, um, thinking about how her work is more permanent these days. So many of these quilts can't be displayed um, all the time because they're fragile, they're fabric. Well, one work that will always be on view is in Harlem at the 125th uh, Street subway station. There's a mosaic there designed by Faith Ringgold and it's called Flying Home. And so it features all of these prominent members of the community flying through the air, sort of like her figure from, um, from her, her book and from her story quilt about Tar Beach. I also love the, the notion of people like, rushing off the subway to get home, flying home. And I think because um, things are going well at, at this point in her career, things are more stable, she is able to publish her autobiography, which she calls We Flew Over the Bridge. Cassie Louise Lightfoot uh, continues to be this inspiration to her because she also establishes the Anyone Can Fly Foundation, which um, has a mission essentially of, uh, of promoting the work of African American artists. And, um, and so there's a lot about her legacy that is becoming more permanent. And I think that allows her to dip her toe into, um, into uh, uh, more pointed criticism in her work. So this is a work that's called We Came to America from 1997. And we can see um, a burning slave ship in the background that's connected by, uh, by smoke to the torch of this Statue of Liberty, which in this case is a black woman. And we see uh, dozens of black bodies flailing in New York Harbor. Of course, a, a, a reference to the atrocities of the slave trade and and I think it's um, it's just as as tough to look at and um, and just as important to look at as, as some of those paintings from the 1960s. Uh, also, with you know the flailing arms and um, and displayed body parts, uh, it's also a reference to some works that that are even close to us in Massachusetts, like the um, uh, J.M.W. Turner's slave ship from 1840 that's at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where we can see. Uh, 
another depiction of a slave ship in the background that has thrown over the dead and dying slaves into the middle of the ocean. Here, the focus is really like the chains and the hands and the feet. And here it's, it's their humanity. It's all of these upward gazes questioning what's happening here. Now, there are major moments, political events that uh, make uh, Faith Ringgold inspired to create works of art and, and uh, contribute to a sense of, of uh, of this feeling of unity. So after the, the attacks of September 11th, she went back to this format of the flag and says, on Tuesday morning, we faced the devil in the sky and told him that freedom will not die. We've come a long way from the flag for the moon, but that's not to say she doesn't still create work that, um, that pushes her audience to think of the world in a different way. She did a series of prints um, called the Declaration of Freedom and Independence that basically contrast white experience with black experience historically um, in relationship to the text of, uh, of the Declaration of Independence. So here, all men are created equal at the bottom. The white men um, feel like their, their rights are trampled on, their equality is trampled on by having a British monarch. But of course, you contrast that with the black experience where they are, um, they are dehumanized by uh, being captured into slavery. And so we, we um, we're reminded of that by the uh, particularly horrific conditions of a slave ship. Uh, oh, and I should go back to this notion of all men are created equal. This next page is, is simply called End Women. And she contrasts uh, the writings of Abigail Adams to Sojourner Truth and the way that they both um, advocated in their own way for the equality of women through their writing. And I'll just end this, this look at this print series with, um, with another one that's called Absolute Tyranny. She references Paul Revere's famous depiction of the Boston Massacre, where I think about five people died, with um, with the absolutely abhorrent legacy of of the lynching of African American people in our country that has stretched on for uh, decades, if not centuries, um, and so showing once again that that the white and the black experience of absolute tyranny looks very different. Uh, the election of Barack Obama was a very hopeful period in um, in Faith Ringgold's life, and she was invited to take part in an exhibition of forty four artists, forty four because he's the forty fourth president, who all painted and kind of decorated a sculptural bust of the president. She included a great deal of text that wrapped around about, you know, loving him, loving his family. But you can see in comparison to the other works here, uh, her painting is pretty tame. I think she went back and, um, and created another version that's more in reference to her, um, her series of paintings about the flag. But, um, but she, does, she does engage with the subject of Barack Obama in other works. This work you'll see, she goes back to that, um, that textile composition that we saw back in the 1960s. And here she uses text to say, born in the USA. And of course, when you contrast that with the face of Barack Obama, we're reminded of the birther movement, which was already alive and well in um, 2012 when she created this. And it reminds me of the painting that she created of the black youth from 1964. The young man who was full of promise who could have achieved anything had there not been racism that was taking him down. And I think Faith Ringgold could sort of see the birther move movement for what it was and see the potential for taking down a person who was full of promise. Even in her, um, even in her golden years, she's ever the innovator. She actually created her own version of Sudoku that is... Um, it's all visual based, but it still has the, the logic puzzle of Sudoku. And when you're done, you get a, a Faith Ringgold quilt at the end. And so these days, the world is much more ready, prepared to look at her work, to talk about her work, to engage with it. So that work that had the big mural for R Rikers Island that had been whitewashed has since been preserved. And it's now going to um, the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Faith Ringgold's really happy about that. More people will get to see it. The flag is bleeding has only just been acquired by the National Gallery of Art back in last year, this fall of last year. So think about it. She's been holding on to this work since 1967. People just weren't ready for it, I don't think. And um, happily, there is a retrospective of her career in New York City 
opening this month at the new museum. It's up until June. I really want to get a bus trip going to this because um, there's there's so much to see, including all of that series, the French collection, even the ones that are, are owned privately. So I feel like this is such a great opportunity to see her work. So we'll finish up with these two images of her. Um, one uh, with that with, with that self-portrait from 1965, where she sort of found her voice with, with the uh, portrait of the, um, of, of the Black youth in the background, and a more recent picture kind of showing how far she's come. Now, Faith Ringgold, what a career. She has won more than 80 awards. She has more than, I, I think, 23 honorary doctorates to her name. She's got a career that has broken boundaries all along the way, not just with her subject matter, but with her art practice. And she's been advocating for the advancement and equality and free speech of her fellow artists for decades. So she's an artist that has told her story in such a beautiful way. And I think America and the art world are better for it. So I will end there and I welcome any questions or comments anybody has about Faith Ringgold. I'll start looking at the chat too. Um, I'm seeing two questions in the chat, Dane. Um, first is from Liz. What kind of paint did she use on her quilts? I think she, I think, I know for the most part it was acrylic. I don't know if it was exclusively acrylic, but um, whenever I've checked, it's usually acrylic. <laughs> um, and so for most of her compositions, just to give you a sense in terms of what's painted and what isn't, if we go back here to something like this, oh, here, um, like almost all of this would have been painted and then it's pieced fabric along uh, along the border. And then Donna asked, are either one of her daughters in the art world? Donna, thanks for coming tonight, first of all. Um, and thanks for this question. Her One of her daughters is Barbara Wallace, who has um, a really sort of distinguished career in, um, in academics and in public life. Uh, I don't believe she's a visual artist herself, but I think she also has a pretty big job now of kind of managing her mother's body of work and her legacy. So, um, so not too long ago, I joined the Faith Ringgold Society on Facebook and, and her daughter manages that. So, um, so I think they're still pretty involved in her life these days. Laura, I'm glad to see you're thinking about going to that show. Um, and then why weren't women uh, allowed to attend art school? Wendy asks. Wendy, good question. Um, well, even the college that I went to uh, only allowed men up until the 1970s. I think a lot of a lot of institutions just had these arbitrary rules about who they were going to teach. <laughs> so, um, so I think I, I think that's why I think they just weren't training women in certain fields. They didn't feel like women could do certain, certain uh, work apparently, but, but that's, that's a good question worth asking. <laughs> um, all good questions. Uh, she still owns many of her quilts and her works. Is this her choice? She must have had offers for many, I think. Um, and such a good question. I, I think uh, in recent years, probably yes. I think because of the Me Too movement and because of Black Lives Matter, now there's so many more people who are thinking about representation in general. You know, if you're going to stage an exhibit, doesn't it make sense to have a Black artist? Doesn't it make sense to have female artists? Um, but let me tell you, the art world was not oriented that way for such a long time. And, um, and like I said, these are really, many of her works are really, really challenging. So they're also very fragile just by the nature of, of what's created. So, I mean, some of these works are in institutions. I know, um, I, I believe it was the Tar Beach quilt. It was uh, donated to the Guggenheim Museum. They didn't exhibit it. Uh, uh, for decades. <laughs> so, so some, I, I think there's a lot of, I, I think we assume that people would really be scrambling to own these things. And, and there, and there wasn't a demand, I, I don't think really until the, the last decade or so when I think there's a new appreciation for her work. Um, let's see here. Anne asked, does the National Museum of African American History own any? And offhand, I don't know. I would have to double check that. Laura's asking about the MFA in Boston. I am, I'm assuming that like most, 
most encyclopedic museums, I would imagine, in the United States probably own one or two. Even the Courier Museum in my hometown owns one. Um, it's it's kind of tough because she really liked storytelling, so she would do these these series and a standalone quilt. It, it's um, it's out of place in so many ways. It's hard to tell the whole story because they're complicated stories. She's like ah. writing novels in some cases. So, um, so I think that uh, the the one that's in my hometown is very rarely on view. I think over the past decade or so, it's only been on view for um, maybe a year. And do you know of any other contemporary Black artists who credit Faith Ringgold as their inspiration? Um, well, I. The first name that pops into my mind, but I'm not sure how much she credits Faith Ringgold, but I'm thinking of Bisa Butler. And if you got to see that quilt exhibit at the MFA over the past few months, Bisa Butler's work is, uh, she's a contemporary artist. She's a, a relatively young woman and she creates really striking uh, works in fabric. And so I, I would imagine that it, to some degree, she at, at the very least thinks of Faith Ringgold as a trailblazer to her, but I'm not sure specifically if she goes beyond that, but Bisa Butler is someone to look up. Her work is extraordinary. And Wendy says, I'm, I'm sad that her work went for such a paltry sum. I wonder why Oprah didn't acquire it, seeing that she commissioned it. That's a really good question. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can't I can't believe that in 2014 you could get a Faith Run Gold quilt for less than half a million dollars. I that, that makes me wonder um how many uh how many quilts Oprah might already own. <laughs> and you know, in some ways it's nice that it's in a public uh, public collection so people can go and learn about Maya Angelou and and her contributions to American culture. Okay, that was really wonderful. Thank you. All right, I think I've gotten through most of these. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I really appreciate your interest in the subject matter, and I hope um, I hope you come away with a, a, a real appreciation for Faith Ringgold and and her work because oh, it, it's been such a rewarding experience for me to put this together and to learn more about her. I remember when I told my husband that she's got the retrospective in New York, he just turned around and said, when are we going? Because <laughs> I can't stop talking about her. <laughs> so. thank, thank you so very much. This is um, visually stimulating and thought provoking. And I think these images will stay with us for a very long time. So um, on behalf of the Maynard Library and the Randall Library in Stowe, thank you everybody and, and good night. Thanks everybody, take care.